So I've been thinking lately and studying about the unity of Scripture, or I'm sorry, the unity within the church, uh, which leads me to this passage um, with Pastor Steve's um, help. So how are we supposed to think about the body of Christ, especially we, we see a lot of um, differences, different denominations out there, um, and a long history of church splits. What, is the, what does the Bible have to say about unities? Um, so before we get started there, um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your kindness and grace in our lives. Uh, we recognize that you've given us um, everything we have uh, in Christ and in your word. Uh, we ask that you would use this time to your glory and to our good. Please keep me uh, speaking your truth and your truth alone. And we ask that you would um, open hearts to, to hear what you have to say uh, through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on verses 1 through 10, but I want to read the whole um, verses 1 through 16 for some context here. So Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and, the and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, so notice here, and get this. Notice here that uh, this passage starts off with therefore. So rather than starting precisely with this text, uh, we need to start with a, a quick overview of the first three chapters. Um, I think these are fairly common in our circles, so hope we're going to go through them quickly, and hopefully this will be just a reminder for most of us. So please uh, take, take a look with me. So in chapter 1, um, my heading here says, Spiritual Blessings in Christ. Chapter 1 starts off by discussing God's blessings to us in Christ. So these are the sorts of things that are true for all believers from chapter 1. We're chosen to be holy and blameless. We're predestined for adoptions as sons. We have redemption through, his blood, through Christ's blood. We have forgiveness of our sins. We have knowledge of his plan to unite all things in Christ. We have a guaranteed inheritance that is sealed with the Holy Spirit. So God's given us these amazing blessings based on his plan from the beginning of time. It's his work, not ours. Paul then gives thanks and praise for the Ephesians, and then begins chapter 2 uh, with some, some more glorious truths. Um, specifically, these are some of the really common ones. We were dead in our sins, but God raised us to life. By grace, we've been saved through faith, and that we're God's workmanship, and we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So the second half of chapter 2, um, I'm sorry, again, this, these are things that are true for all believers. They're emphasizing God's work for us in salvation. Again, it's his work, not ours. We were simply dead, but God made us alive. There's nothing we can do apart from God to gain this life, this salvation. It's all by grace, and we're his workmanship. So then in verse 11, it turns to talking about the Gentiles. The Gentiles, we find, were were separated from Christ. They're alienated from Israel, strangers to the covenant, had no hope without God. They're far away, divided by a wall of hostility. So you see this 
the, in the past tense, the, the Gentiles were separated. There's this disunity there, both with um, the people of Israel and with God the Father. But now in Christ, the Gentiles are brought near. They're made one with the Jews. Along with the Jews, they're reconciled to God. They have peace with the Father. We have access to the Spirit and the Father. Fellow citizens, we're made fellow citizens of God's kingdom and are being built together into a dwelling place for God himself. So we see here God's plan for unity, making one unified people for himself, united both with himself and with each other, and this crosses major, major social boundaries between the Jews and the Gentiles. So chapter 3, um, we then see how God gave Paul the particular grace of preaching this message. Um, and then Paul goes on and he has a further prayer for the Gentiles. I'm sorry, for the Ephesians. So because of this background in chapters 1 through 3, I think primarily the context where chapter 4 starts out with therefore, primarily he's talking about the doctrines in chapters 1 and 2. So I'm going to summarize that with this at the bottom. So God's choice was to bless us, meaning specifically us Christians, um, immensely in Christ. God saved us by grace, not our good works. And we are God's workmanship to do his work. And his, um, part of his plan is to create one unified people for himself. So that is the therefore. So therefore... Paul's urging us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. So he's, he's calling us to act differently. It's not enough just to, to have these truths. These truths imply that we need to walk differently. Um, he's specifically talking to the Ephesians, but by extension, um, his therefore applies to all of us who are similarly have these same truths, these same truths of being recipients of God's grace. So we ought not to look like everybody else. Our lives are supposed to be radically different. So let's talk about this, I, a prisoner for the Lord. So Paul, too, had a calling. So he was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He had been faithful to the calling, even to the point of now, he, as he's writing this, he's likely a prisoner um, in jail. So from this perspective, as um, one who's been walking in a manner worthy of the calling, he's then urging the Ephesians to walk in in the same way. Um, so as an aside, this should be an ex Paul should be an example for anyone that gets up here um, and is t preaching or teaching. We ought to make sure that our walk matches our talk. So let's look at that word urge. So kids, think of other words we could put in here. Paul could have said he recommended us do some things. He might have said, we su I suggest you do these things. But he doesn't say that. Urging means that Paul's very confident in what he's saying. And that what he's urging them to do really, really matters. This is important. This is a way of saying to the Christian, listen to what I'm about to tell you and make sure you do it. So let's move on to the details. What is it that's so important that Paul's urging us to do? First, to walk with all humility. So notice there's an all here, right? This is not just a little bit of humility. This is all humility. So humility is supposed to saturate our lives. So remember from chapter 2, each of us were dead in our sins. There was nothing we could do to save ourselves. Only by God's grace have we been saved. Further, everything we have, our salvation, our time, our responsibilities, our resources, everything we have, we've been given. There's no place for pride in the Christian, only humility. God's plan that we've been called to be a part of is for his glory, not ours. Further, pride sets the stage for disunity. This opposes the plan of God in chapter 2 for the unity of the body. So what's this look like? At an interpersonal level, this looks like perhaps listening to others, um, listening to what they have to say rather than thinking you know everything in a discussion. It looks like not taking the glory for yourself when something good happens. Um, it looks like being willing to admit when you're wrong or when you've sinned against someone and going to them and, and humbly asking for forgiveness. At a larger level, we can think of having humility towards others in other doctrinal traditions. So while f sticking firmly to the truth, humility says we resist looking down at others who, with whom we disagree. Second, with all gentleness. So this word all also applies to gentleness. So when someone does something that irritates you, the response is all gentleness. When someone else disagrees with you, all gentleness. When you need to deal with someone else's sin, as Pastor Steve's been talking about in this issue of purity, for instance, the, the way you deal with that has to be all gentleness. 
As we see in verse 12, one of the purposes God has for us is to build up the body of Christ and not to tear it down. And hence, Paul urges all gentleness. Patience. So this is a heart that is set on being slow to anger. It looks like not getting quickly upset with people. God's patience toward us as sinners is the model for our patience with each other. Okay. Bearing with one another in love. So part of being a Christian is, is admitting that we are all imperfect sinners, um, saved by grace. So despite our quirks, our imperfections, um, and how that particular person's habits just really get under my skin, we're still called to be part of the same body of Christ. And so some of these things that might naturally drive us apart, we're called to bear with in love. Consider the magnitude of the blessings that we talked about in chapter 1. Compare those to the minor irritations that come in living with close proximity with each other. So let's just bear with them in agape, self-sacrificing love. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So note this, this call to maintain unity implies that we already have unity. That unity is already there. God set it up in, in inviting us and making us part of his kingdom. So we are, should be eager to maintain that unity. Our heart should be aligned with God's heart in this unity of the church here. So we have peace with God, peace with each other through Christ, and we need to live that out and maintain the unity that God has built. So looking at the whole of these things that Paul's urging us to, we see that all of them pertain in some way to our relationships with each other. And thus Paul is calling us to act in a way that is the logical result of our true unity with Christ, um, which is what he then turns back to in verse 4. So this next section starts emphasizing the unity and the basis for unity of the church. Notice that he switched back to teaching doctrine rather than urging to action as he just was. He seems to be building on the theme of unity that he started back in chapter 2, and he's going to put some more detail on it. Notice the repetition here of the word one and the word all. One body, one spirit, one hope. So despite the differences in race, denomination, gender, age, or anything else, these are the things that bind all true Christians together and form the basis for real unity. So let's take a look. One body. So what, what does this one body mean? To, to define this, you might turn back to chapter 1, verse 20, verses 22 and 23. So this says that he, meaning God the Father, put all things under his feet, meaning Christ, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So right here in chapter 1, Paul uh, is defining the, the word body as meaning the church. So kids, we, we sometimes use the word church in different ways. So let's make sure we're understanding this correctly. So we might be in this building here, this one that's being renovated, we might call that a church building. We might also talk about the body, local body here as the church, the Church of Arbor Church. But sometimes we use this word church to mean all Christians everywhere. And that seems to be the sense of which Paul is using this um, this here, the church here, which is Christ's body, there's one church, and he's referring to the universal church. So, so let's think about that idea of a body. So, so kids, I want you to look at your fingers. Hold up, hold up two fingers for me. Do your fingers often get into disagreements with each other? Do they, do they argue with each other and fight with each other? Yes or no, kids? Do, do, do your fingers get into disagreements? No, no, of course not. Does your right hand get angry with your left hand? Are they getting into an argument? No, this is, this is silly. They're both part of one body, and they're controlled by your brain, so you're, you don't expect your fingers or your, your hands to get into arguments with each other. So similarly, we Christians are part of God's one body, taking orders from Christ, who's the head. So rather than fighting amongst ourselves, we should get busy listening to the head and working together to accomplish his purposes. Let's look at one spirit. So the Holy Spirit, we know, dwells in all true believers. There's not a Methodist spirit and a Presbyterian spirit or a Reformed spirit. Um, there's not an American spirit or an African spirit. There's one spirit who indwells all true believers. Let's look at one hope. 
So a lot of this is covered in, the, in those first few chapters of Ephesians. Um, there's a whole bunch of glorious things that God's call us to. We have a hope of being part of God's kingdom, part of his household, of becoming more like Christ, of being united with, with, with God in eternity. We have an inheritance that's sealed by the Spirit. We're being built together into one dwelling place for God. Thus, all believers have the same hope. One Lord. This is referring to Jesus Christ. We all have Jesus Christ as our Lord. And the word Lord here means master, in the sense of the master of the house. So we're talking about one with authority. When we, when we refer to Christ as Lord, we're referring to him in the sense of one with authority. So that goes back to the body. As Christ is the head, we're his body, and we all submit to that same authority. We're, we're not in different organizations here. We're all under Christ's authority. One faith. This refers to the basic doctrines of the Bible that we believe by faith, such as God's creation, man's fall into sin, how we're unable to save ourselves, how God, by his grace, has um, brought Jesus to earth as one fully God, fully man, how he died on the cross for our sins, and for our salvation by grace through faith. These things, the faith, are so core to Christianity that to deny them would be not to be a Christian. This unity in core Christian doctrines is true of all believers. One baptism. So there's some debate here in the commentaries on whether this means the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the baptism by water. So if it's by the Holy Spirit, then that's a little bit repetitive with what's already been said here in the text. We had one spirit earlier. So I believe this is talking about the baptism by water. So this is, um, we're talking about the symbolism of being united with Christ and of entering his body um, that comes with baptism. So we're not discussing here the differences in modes of baptism, sprinkling versus immersion. So despite those different modes of baptism, there's a unity here in the one body of Christ that we're baptized into. One God and Father of all. So true Christians all serve the same God. He is over all. Again, just like Christ, um, this is indicating authority. And by that authority, he's commanded in verse 3 this eagerness for unity. So though our church only recognizes elders as an earthly authority, whereas other traditions have more of a hierarchical authority scheme, all of those that are true Christians are under God's authority. And so we're not different organizations. There's only one ultimate authority here and only one ultimate body of Christ. God is through all, which is a little bit of a puzzling statement, but seems to be referring back to um, chapter 2. He works, we are his workmanship, and he's working through us. Um, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, and that's um, how he works through us. He's in all. This references, again, back to chapter 2, verse 22, where the church is being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Thus, we can say that God's plan is to dwell in all of his people by the Spirit. We're going to come back to this concept in a few verses. So to, to sum up this section, the unity of the body of Christ is at the level of the universal church for which all of these various things are true. As such, our identity ought to be primarily with those with, with this universal truth, church, along with all of those who are saved by grace. We should resist any temptation to base our identity in something else than our identity in, as part of Christ's body. Rather, we should be eager to maintain the unity of the universal church because this is the level at which God is working. Okay, let's move on to verse 7. But... So this indicates a change in direction. So we've got this amazingly strong foundation and basis for unity, but that doesn't mean that there's uniformity. Uh, so we see here that God's, that Christ is giving different gifts to each according to a, the measure of Christ's gifts, or each according to kind of a, a quantity of grace. So especially in light of verse 11, we should see this to mean that Christ has given each of us true Christians different spiritual gifts, so we don't all have to look the same, even though we're in the, um, we have this amazing unity. To be more precise, verse 11 calls um, the people with certain spiritual gifts as the gift themselves. And I, 
hopefully with God's grace, we're going to be looking at that um, in the future. So we don't all look alike, and that's okay. It's all part of God's plan. There's a, there's a diversity here um, along with this unity. So Paul then goes on to quote, this is Psalm 68, verse 18. So Christ is being alluded to here as a conquering king. So the clear um, association here that Paul is discussing, um, the connection here is with the gifts. So Christ, uh, when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. But note, as an aside, he's, he's talking about Christ's ascension. So he's pointing down this idea that if Christ ascended, that first meant that he had to descend. So we're seeing here a hint in the Old Testament of Christ coming down and this, this descension from his divinity to becoming the fully God, fully man. So there's this unity between the Old Testament predicting what the New Testament makes clear here. So Christ is not, um, is not a mere man. And this is shown even more completely there in the end that after he descended, he ascended not just to the heavens, but far above all the heavens. So Christ's position as glorified son means that he is above the heavens themselves, and he will fill all things. So it might be tempting um, to skip over this idea of being filled with Christ. Is it kind of seems like a side comment here that doesn't necessarily fit with the rest of the passage. But let's go ahead and look at John 17, um, and we're going to actually see that this idea of being filled with Christ is, is connected to the unity of the body. So please go ahead and t- hold, your, hold your finger here in Ephesians and turn to John 17. So for context, this is part of the um, high priestly prayer that Christ prays on the night before he's crucified. So he's just finished um, praying for his disciples, and we're going to pick up in verse 20. John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So note first here that Jesus is praying for, quote, those who will believe in me through their word. So he's talking about those who are going to believe um, in Jesus through the preaching of the disciples. So that includes all true Christians today. So Jesus is actually praying for us here in this room. Uh, Note his heart for the universal church um, having perfect oneness um, to the same extent that God the Father and the Son are one. So without being tempted to exposit this whole whole section, um, let's, let's skip down to verse 23. Christ says, I in them and you in me that they may be perfectly one. So Jesus is telling us his strategy here, Christ in us and God in Christ. In other words, that we're filled with Christ And that's what leads to unity. Notice he says that they may be perfectly one. That's clearly a reference to to unity. So kids, I want you to help me again um, to understand this concept. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a brother and sister and you've ever had an argument with them. Anybody ever had an argument with their brother and sister? Yeah, that's like almost all of us who have brothers and sisters. So let's think about the cause. What causes those arguments? Maybe you wanted to do something, and your brother or sister wanted to do something else. Um, Maybe you wanted to play a game, and they wanted to play a different game. Or maybe you guys had um, differences in opinion on on who was going to play what role. So there's this idea of um, you want one thing, and they want another thing, and that leads to conflict. So I'm going to represent that up on the screen here with two arrows. One arrow represents your heart and your desires. And... And the green one represents their heart and their desires. And notice these are going in opposite, in different directions, right? So that's going to lead to to conflict or distress. And notice also that neither of these are aligned with the direction of Christ. So the idea here is that, um, so how is filling with Christ connected to unity? The idea here is that if I become filled with Christ, uh, Christ just doesn't let me keep going in the same direction. 
right? He works in my heart, and he starts changing the direction of my heart to line up with his heart. So, uh, so this is part of, of the filling um, that, that Christ is talking about in these verses. So if that happens with both people, if both people come filled with Christ, and both people's hearts start becoming aligned with Christ, notice now that we're both going in the same direction. And so this sets the way for unity. So that's how it seems that the filling of Christ um, is connected with this concept of unity. So if I'm, from Ephesians 4, if I'm eager to be maintaining the unity of the Spirit, then I need to emphasize first, am I being filled with Christ? Am I being saturated with Christ? Am I overflowing with Christ in my heart? Okay, so now back to Ephesians 4. So the the text said that Jesus was going to ascend far above the heavens so that he might fill all things, right? So back in John, he talked about filling Christians, but this text actually says that he's going to fill all things. So what's going on there? Let's look at Ephesians 1 for a little bit of a hint to this mystery. So Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. This says that God is making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in himself, in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So this plan that God has isn't just to unite a people for himself, but it's to unite all things, all things in heaven on earth. So we have Christ filling Christians, which leads to unity among Christians, We have Christ ascending above the heavens to fill all things, and we have here in Ephesians 1 God's plan to unite all things in Christ. So in the end, all things are going to be united in Christ. Everything is either going to be filled with Christ, united with him, or separated from Christ for eternity. So let's go ahead and wrap this up by summarizing what we've looked at. We are called to some amazing, glorious blessings in Christ. Um, we're called to be part of God's one unified church. And that calling is, um, part of that calling is a call to act differently because of the unity that we have and because of the bless- blessings that we have in Christ. This, this is things like humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with an, each other in love, eagerness to maintain unity. We also see that Christ gives different gifts to the church, and so that our unity doesn't mean we all look the same. And we see that ultimately, God's going to unite all things through the filling of Christ. So let's go ahead and and end there um, with prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your plan to bring us into your kingdom, into your family and to bring a unity among people, even here on earth, um, that is different, that that shows the world um, what you're doing, and that is an evidence of of your work in our lives. God, we ask that you would give us that spirit of unity here at Arbor, and that we together would have a spirit of unity with the rest of the church throughout the world. And God, we, we pray practically that you would develop hearts in us that are aligned with your heart, hearts of of humility and graciousness with each other, of gentleness, and of eagerness for, for the unity of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.